Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to the Scholarly Communications channel on the New Books Network. My name is Jen Hoyer, and today I'm joined by Kristen Ann Haas, author of Blunt Instruments, Recognizing Racist Cultural Infrastructure in Memorials, Museums, and Patriotic Practices, published by Beacon Press in January 2023. Cultural infrastructure has been designed to maintain structures of inequality, and while it doesn't seem to be explicitly about race, it often is. Blunt Instruments helps readers identify, contextualize, and name elements of our everyday landscapes and cultural practices that are designed to seem benign or natural, but which in fact work tirelessly to tell us vital stories about who we are, how we came to be, and who belongs. Kristen Ann Haas is professor in the Department of American Culture and director of the Humanities Collaboratory at the University of Michigan. Kristen, welcome to New Books Network. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Um, Before we get started talking about your book, could you share a little bit with listeners about your background, um, where you grew up and went to school, and what brought you to your research on monuments and cultural heritage? Sure. I grew up in Berkeley, California in the 70s, which that's a lot of information right there. (laughs) And I, I, um, I went to public schools from the you know, first day I walked into kindergarten through college, I went to the University of Michigan, where I teach now for my undergraduate and graduate degree. And I lived a little bit when I was a kid in Virginia. And I think um, that experience sort of going back and forth between Virginia and California started to spark my interest in memorials and in patriotic practices and in museums. I was interested in what what made people feel patriotic, what made people feel connected to something larger than themselves. And also just as a kid growing up in the culture, I was really interested in how structures of inequity get maintained. I mean, obviously as a kid, I didn't have that language But going to the Berkeley Public Schools, schools that were not segregated, um, schools in which all different kinds of kids from different economic and racial backgrounds went to school together every day, it, it was clear to me that the culture was telling me something that was a lie, you know, that we were all, that we were all living with a series of lies about race, about gender. And so I got really interested in kind of how big ideas move through the culture. And I um, was always interested in equity, but I really focused on patriotism. When I graduated from college, I didn't really know what I was going to do. And I got an internship at the Smithsonian, the National Museum of American History, um, which was a place I loved. And and being there sort of enabled me, A, to learn a lot about museums, but also to think about who gets to tell the stories we tell about who we are in the United States um, and how that process works. So all of that kind of pushed me, you know, opened up a lot of questions for me. And then um, because I was an intern and I wasn't being paid, I... Um, uh, was also a nanny, and I needed some time to myself. So I'd run around the National Mall. The, the Museum of American History is on the National Mall. I would run around the National Mall on my lunch hour, and I would run by the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And this was a long time ago when tragedies did not automatically lead to teddy bears and flowers and flags at the side of the tragedy. But I would run by the Vietnam Memorial and I would see these things at the base of the memorial. And I realized, oh, these are people who were doing what we're trying to do in the museum in this kind of official mediated way, but they're just telling their story with their things. So that kind of, that pulled me in very explicitly to the study of memorials. And it turns out that memorials are a really great place to study patriotism, belonging, inclusion, and the explicit expression of ideas that we don't always make explicit about belonging in, in the nation. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, those connections that you just described between different types of like cultural infrastructure, I, it's really neat to see them come together in this book. Um, so turning to this book, could you share about how you came to write Blunt Instruments and what some of your main goals were for the book? Yeah. Uh, you know, in 2020, suddenly everybody was talking about memorials. And I had been quietly <laughs> thinking about and studying memorials, you know, for 20 years. And I was fascinated by the public conversation. And I felt like, and people were talking not just about monuments, but about museums and patriotic practices. And I felt like there were a few things that I knew that would be really useful additions to the public conversation. So people on CNN were getting up and during COVID and putting on their ties and going and, you know, making their way through the conversation about monuments. But I felt like there were a couple of big ideas that were missing from the conversation that needed to be added. And, and one, and this is true for monuments, museums, and patriotic practices, is that we need to understand them as tools. And as soon as we start talking about a monument as a tool, it really changes how we have to have the conversation about it because monuments, um, all of this cultural infrastructure, its magic is that it seems eternal. It seems preordained. It seems neutral and benign. And in fact, none of these things, museums, memorials, patriotic practices are anything like neutral and benign. They are made things and they're made to do specific kind of work in the culture. So I decided to write this book because I felt like, wait, <laughs> yes, all of these debates about monuments and about what we need to do to decolonize the museum and how we need to rethink our patriotic practices are fantastic. But the debates were happening at what seemed to me kind of a surface level because they weren't really seeing them as tools and they weren't seeing these things as part of a structure, part of a system that existed, a system of cultural infrastructure. And so to get back to my earlier remark about sort of observing the culture as a child and thinking, you know, how does, how does the lie of inequity get maintained it seemed to me as an adult, an important part of the answer is the lies about inequity get maintained in the culture through this cultural infrastructure that most of us are participate in in a kind of benign way, but aren't really aware of and don't really see as a system that defines who we are and who gets to belong, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. I feel like what you have added gives a lot of um, like nuance to help us see that more clearly. Um, and so then moving into the, the main content of the book, there's three major sections, memorials, museums, and patriotic practices. So if we start with the first section on memorials, you do a really clear job of outlining the work that memorials and monuments do. Uh, could you break down some of that work for listeners, maybe with a few examples? Sure. So as I've already said, the, the, the key is to understand them as tools. So when, um, when people debate memorials, a lot of the debate has been um, about whether or not um, history is being changed or whether or not we're sort of throwing out history or we're rewriting history. And that, that assumes that the memorials actually represent the past. And in fact, most memorials are a made up version of the past. And most memorials are tools that make up a version of the past to do cultural work for the who, whoever built them. Um, so I think, I mean, I break it down very specifically in the book. There are eight, you know, important things to know about monuments. They're powerful, 
They're made to blend into the landscape. They are more about the time in which they are made than they are about the time about which they are made. So a, a memorial to the Civil War made in 19... 19- 19 is more about 1919 than it is about 1865. Um, They are, memorials are made by people who have something to say. Um, They are not neutral reflections of the world. They are points being made in the world. Um, They invent a past. They do not reflect exactly what happened in the past. And they often reflect anxiety. It's when you walk by a um, guy on a horse in a park, you, you, it's hard to understand that that is an expression of anxiety about ideology rather than just uh, uh, um, an unmediated statement of who we are. Um, And finally, um, memorials use a certain set of conventions that have evolved somewhat over time, but have stayed fairly consistent to do all of this work. Um, and I think for me, I take comfort in, um, I take comfort in the idea that they're made to, to make a point and that they're made to, in response to anxiety, because you could, You could look at the, for instance, the Confederate memorials in the landscape and think all all of the people who have walked by these memorials over the years share that ideology, were born to share that ideology, have always shared that ideology. But in fact, memorials remind us that somebody felt like they needed to make that argument, you know, that it's not that we were all all white people in the southern half of the United States and all white people in the northern half of the United States were born mean and um, ready to put their boots on the throats of black and brown people. There are a lot of people who felt like they needed to do a lot of work to convince people, right, to tell a story of who we are that put that at the center. So, um, So I think that's... Some of this is, is, um, you know, some of these are hard stories to tell, but for me, I, I take a lot of comfort in the fact that, okay, these are tools that people felt like they had to use to make the argument to support white supremacy, which means there were a lot of people who weren't on board with white supremacy. And I think you asked me for some examples, um, the Confederate memorials, which have finally in the last 10, years received a huge amount of attention that they they really needed to receive. Um, They're really, they're, they're much more interesting than the arguments, a lot of the public conversation about them would lead us to believe. So the sort of simple argument is their heritage, right? They are, they represent the the familial, the bloodline past of um, a certain group of people, so they're off limits in that way, um, or that they're really they're not at all about race, which is a um, an argument that just cracks me up. <laughs> Nothing to see here, folks. You know, just keep moving. Um, uh, when in fact, I mean, one of the things that I think is really interesting, the, the, the familial argument, um, people now defend these monuments as if they talk about them as if they were built by the mothers of soldiers who fell on the battlefields of, you know, Gettysburg. And um, in fact, they were built, the war ended in 1865, the movement led by a group of women, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, a very, very smart, powerful, potent group of women. Um, they started to build them in the 1890s. So that, there's quite a gap between the end of the war and this movement. And the, the movement to build the memorial coincides with the solidification of the Jim Crow laws in the South with um, 
the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which codifies segregation as legal um, throughout the United States. Um, these monuments were built to shore up white supremacy, not just to celebrate fallen sons. And, and I think I use a couple of examples like this, but if you go and read the speeches, and they're, they're pretty easy to find often, that were given at the dedications of these memorials, you come to see, oh yeah, okay, these are tools. And people were using them in a very specific way to support a very specific ideology. My um, favorite example of this is the story of Silent Sam, who stood for a very long time, 1913 to 1920, I mean, sorry, to, to 1913 to 2020, um, maybe 21, um, a Confederate monument, a uh, young figure of a soldier standing on the campus. Um, and when students, you know, starting really in the 1960s complained, uh, but really most more um, vociferously in the 21st century, the argument was made, he's benign. He's, this is about mourning mothers, mourning their children. Uh, but if you go and read some of the speeches that were made at the dedication of his, this monument, one in particular by a guy named Julian Carr, Julian Carr tells the story of... Um, this is, he's telling the story in 1913, but it's about um, 20 years earlier when he um, beat a black woman, whipped her so that her dress was hanging in shreds. So if that's the condition of her dress, you can imagine the condition of her flesh um, in front of a whole garrison of law enforcement sent to protect people in the South. So it would have been more than 20 years earlier, but it would have been during Reconstruction. And um, the, he tells the story very proudly because they they didn't say a word, they didn't stop him, they didn't step in, they didn't protect her. And he says in his speech, so all is well that ends well, right? And that's what we're celebrating with the dedication of this memorial. So if anybody had any question about what what the point of building the, that particular memorial was, he answers it quite explicitly and in, you know, gross and bloody and, and um, uh, uh, unsettling terms. So that's, a, that's an example of, you know, um, of Confederate memorials. Um, and I think it's a pretty, pretty powerful one in terms of supporting the idea these are tools and they were tools to tell a particular story about race. Yeah. And I love the, like, I guess, analytical framework that you lay out with showing these clear things that they're doing and, and applying that to different examples. Uh, and then part of your analysis of memorials and monuments is the way that that work shifts over time. Could you speak about how public practices of monument building have changed in U.S. history and how those changes impact the way monuments fit into our landscape? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty interesting story. So before 1890, um, in the earlier, it really before the Civil War, people were not interested in monuments because they seem European, you know, big be, you build a big fancy stone edifice to a monarch, um, not to a an American democratic figure. So people weren't interested, really. And there's some examples when when um, people were very started to get very anxious about the potential of a civil war. They decided to build the Washington Monument make the tallest building that they could make. And it was something of a debacle and didn't get finished till after the war. But essentially our first big investment in memorials came with the, in the 1890s with the building of these Confederate memorials. And then after the first world war between 1920 
and 1980, there was a period where memorials really went out of style. And um, the veterans of the First World War and the Second World War did not want big stone edifices. They really, and I think it, you know, I think it had something to do with, it was kind of clear to them what they had done in the world and they were celebrated for it and they wanted, they, they knew what was good about what they had done and they knew what was not good about what they had done and they wanted to go back to everyday life. So they were interested in living memorials. So kind of no memorials, Confederate memorials, and then a period of living memorials. So lots of swimming pools, basketball courts, auditoriums. Um, I say in the book that my own kids went through their entire childhoods wearing t-shirts that said vets, not because they were thinking of particular veterans, but because they swam on the veterans memorial pool swim team. And the, the veterans who advocated for the living memorials, they really wanted the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure that um, would enable people to enjoy the freedoms for which they had fought. So they didn't want stone. And after the Vietnam Memorial, that changed. And it changed because, I'm sorry, after the Vietnam War, um, it changed because the social position of the Vietnam veteran, like the social position of the Confederate veteran, was unstable. And um, veterans came home, the war was unpopular, veterans felt themselves to be ostracized, they didn't get the GI Bill that the World War II vets got. Um, and one veteran went to see the movie The Deer Hunter, um, which ends with this very moving after you're traumatized by all the details of the 1979 movie, um, ends with a very patriotic singing of God bless America. And he came home from that film and he said, you know, we need to heal the nation. His name is Jan Scruggs. We need to build a memorial. And so he set out to build the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, which started a second memorial boom. And that second memorial boom is quite distinct from the first. They're both sort of fairly preoccupied with race and belonging. But the second boom is about race and militarism and what it means to serve in the U.S. military. And the, the second boom is very much shaped by the fact that Maya Lin designed the Vietnam Memorial. And she was at the time an architect, architecture student at Yale studying war memorials in France that were built in France after the First World War. And she was taken by the lists of names and by these great walls covered with names. So she designed a memorial that kind of flipped the neoclassical design of the big above ground celebratory memorial. She put black granite reflective panels that were buried six feet into the ground and covered them with names. And I think one of the most interesting things she did with that design is previously war memorials had listed the names of the dead alphabetically, Smith, 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 Smith. She listed them in the order in which they died. So there's a narrative on every piece of that memorial. And that memorial was, was controversial, stirred people up. It changed commemorative practices in the United States because people started bringing objects, which they had not done before the Vietnam Memorial. People, people under 30 grew up in a world where there's a tragedy, people bring their teddy bears. Um, but that didn't exist before this memorial. So it, it made memorials matter again, and it made them popular again. It also made military elites in Washington quite nervous because it made service in the United States military tragic and rather than heroic. And another thing that the Vietnam War did was ended the draft. So you have millions of middle, middle schoolers every year getting on a, off a bus in the Capitol to kind of have their pilgrimage to the center of the nation. And they get off the bus and they learn that service in the United States military is going to end a tragedy, not 
you're not going to end up with a guy being a guy on a horse. So that inspired the building of the Korean War Veterans Memorial, the World War II Memorial. It inspired a transformation of the National Mall. So it set in motion the second wave of um, practices in in building memorials. And it also set in motion a series of civil rights memorials that were built, um, especially in the South, but are built, built in different places across the United States. So still tools, still being used to kind of tell a story, um, but the shape of the tool shifts a little bit and the story that they are being used to tell shifts a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And it like, it makes some of them harder to see, um, Mm -hmm. uh, which is an interesting thing to, I'm sure we will talk more about that um, in some of the later sections, but um, then moving to the, the second section of the book where you look at museums, which, um, also really goes back to that internship on the National Mall. Um, it, you point out that even with looking at the details of exhibitions, we can understand the cultural work that museums are doing. What are the major ways that museums have created or reinforced cultural and social norms in the United States? And how has that work changed over time? Yeah, well, to return to the internship, the reason I applied for the internship is I went into that museum. I was visiting Washington. I went into the museum and I walked into an exhibit called Field to Factory. And it was about the great migration of African-Americans from the South to the North um, at the beginning of the 20th century. And as you walked into the exhibit, there was a Klan robe hanging uh, just, uh, just high enough that you kind of had to crane your neck to look up at it. And I thought, oh my God, you can do this? (laughs) <laughs> you can tell that a kind of real version of who we are in a history museum. And okay, this is what I want to do. Um, but the fact that I had the thought, oh my God, you can do this, uh, reveals that we, we have certain expectations about what we're going to get, the kind of knowledge that we're going to get in museums that we are not often explicit about and that museums have not always done a good job of understanding and reacting to. So thinking about the cultural work that museums do and museums as tools and museums as elements of our cultural infrastructure is very useful to do with memorials, but they're also different from memorials. And it's useful, I think a lot of the people who have put their energy into building memorials, especially in the earlier memorial boom, had very explicit ideas about race that they wanted to, um, they wanted to see stay at the center of the culture at all costs. And uh, the history of museums is not the same kind of fervent racist campaign. The history of museums as cultural infrastructure is um, a- ends up having a kind of similar result, but is less um, less explicitly the work of of um, racists, white supremacists, and more a sort of broad reflection of ideologies in the culture about race that end up being white supremacists. So. Um, the big cultural work that museums do is they convey knowledge and they do it with authority and they do it with like memorials with the assumption that they are neutral, that they are benign, that they are not taking a position. And that's really fundamentally untrue about all museums, right? That they, they are not neutral. They are not benign. Um, and they they always take a position. And in the history of museums in the United States, this has manifest in a couple of ways. I talk in the book about the American Museum of Natural History in, in um, New York City and how just standing outside the museum until one year ago, you got a huge clear hit about the ideology that you were going to get inside the museum because outside the museum carved into this big, beautiful neoclassical facade is, are the words, 
um, knowledge, nature, and vision. So you know you're coming in to get to learn about the natural world. And um, in front of the facade was a statue. It was Teddy Roosevelt in the center in a uniform with his um, his clothing, his military uniform and his weapon and the saddle that his horse that was on his horse all um, expressed in fine detail. And on one side, he is flanked by an unnamed, mostly unclothed indigenous figure. And on the other side, he is flanked by a more unclothed, also unnamed African figure. And, um, you know, in a, in a majority black city, um, to have that be the story that 5 million kids going into the museum get, and people have been complaining about it for a very long time, but it wasn't until the murder of George Floyd that it was removed. And the idea that that could stand as, um, that that could stand for so long as a kind of fundamental expression of what you were going to get inside the museum tells you how deep the the resistance in museums, even museums run by good people who would seem to have, you know, understand um, the histories of race and racism. Um, They, you know, they kept that they kept that figure, those figures for a very long time that told a very clear message. So, so that's one. And, and, and then you go inside the museum and in the beautiful great hall, there are still these um, paintings that tell, and, and there's language on the walls that tell the same story that was told outside in, in these figures. Um, Another example that I use in the book to try and get at this is um, the example of a scene at the beginning of the Black Panther movie. Um, If you haven't seen the movie, this takes about, I don't know, less than a minute in the movie, but an important character in the movie comes into the museum. That's a, you know, it's a version of the um, British museum. And he is a person of African descent. He's talking to a white um, female curator, and they're talking about African objects in glass cases. And she, he is trying to correct her about some of the pieces and she's not having it. And, um, they, she says, well, don't worry about this one. I'm going to take it. And she says, well, it's not for sale. And, um, he does take it. And before he takes it, he tells her, so how did your, how did your ancestors get this? Did they steal it? Did they, you know, did they get it fairly? How did it come to be in your hands? And he, anyway, he ends up stealing it and it sets in motion this whole plot about decolonizing, about a a world, an Afrocentric world without uh, colonialism. And the fact that a Marvel movie can, in less than a minute, use a museum to tell this story about power indicates that we all kind of know. We might not be explicit about it always. We might not um, articulate exactly what's happening there. But the fact that Marvel could do that so quickly made me feel like, oh, really? I have to write this whole book. (laughs) Right. They they know the terms of reference and it's just immediately. Yeah. And, the, and that the audience would understand Yeah, that the audience would understand that African objects held in the British Museum or a museum in the United States and displayed in a particular way um, as particular kinds of objects would be an expression of power. And which isn't to say you couldn't have those objects, but knowing where they came from, how they were um, acquired, being responsible for that history. And and then the interior logics of so many museums were really organized around uh, 
an argument that would walk kids through because kids are the still the largest population of visitors to most museums from kind of civilization to from savagery, excuse me, to civilization. So that the climax in so many art museums is the modern art. And most museums for a very long time, the only people in the modern art section in the museum were people from Europe and the United States. And the Japanese collections or the Chinese collections or the collections from other parts of the world were sort of held static in time, not not presented as a, as a narrative of advancement, development, not understood as intellectual traditions. And though even though kids don't stop and think, huh, Japan isn't being represented as, you know, it's being represented as caught in time, they understand the big sweep of the story. That's the kind of blunt work that museums do. Huh. Um. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess moving to the third section of the book, this is where you start talking about patriotic practices that also constitute cultural infrastructure. And I mean, to, to think about things that are like the, the more Im- invisible tools, this is perhaps, um, they're not invisible, but they're less physically structural. Uh, so could you share with listeners what kinds of patriotic practices you examine here and why it's important to scrutinize and understand the work that they do? Yes. Um, the patriotic practices that I look at, although there, there are lots of them, I look mostly in the book at um, the Pledge of Allegiance, the history of the Pledge of Allegiance, and um, the National Anthem. And I think the pledge history is particularly um relevant um, in this moment when we are um, witnessing what's happening in Florida around the public schools, because public schools have always been a key site for cultural infrastructure. As soon as um, school became compulsory in state after state, as soon as there was a critical mass of compulsory education in the United States, which is one of the things that we've done so well. It's such a great, miraculous thing, the way that we developed our system of public education. But as soon as we did that, there were lots of people with an interest in using this captive audience of kids to not only produce patriotism, but produce particular kinds of patriotism in particular moments. So I think it's interesting. The pledge was not written by people who were thinking explicitly about anti-Black racism. They were not thinking about, we need to maintain white supremacy above all else. The people, in fact, the author of the pledge was a socialist in Chicago who, um, I think he would be horrified by some of the uses to which it has been put. But the idea was that we were experiencing this great um, migration of people from Europe, coming to work in the industrial economy, people who didn't necessarily speak English, people who um, didn't understand, didn't have uh, an American ideology other than that there was an opportunity here to, to be something that you couldn't be where they came from and maybe just to feed your family. So the Pledge of Allegiance, which uh, was written to unify um kids around a particular kind of an American ideology. And if you think about the pledge, the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, um, with liberty and justice for all, the language of the pledge is really quite beautiful. Um, And so there have been periods where it was, you know, you could get flags for your school if you promised to say the pledge. The pledge was sold in various ways by various people across time. Um, And then there have been periods in which the pledge was required. So I live in Michigan in, I think it was 2005, um, the governor um, passed a law requiring all students in public schools, not necessarily to say the pledge, but to stop what they were doing for a certain amount of time every day to enable 
people to say the pledge, kids to say the pledge. Um, so it's a tool when people feel like, okay, we need, we need to harness people around a certain kind of uh, Americanism um, that has been used in that way. The national anthem um, is similarly a tool. And I, uh, you know, of course it, it came into public conversation um, in 2016, most potently when Colin Kaepernick decided to take a knee. Initially, he decided, San Francisco 49er football player, decided not to stand during the national anthem. Originally, he sat on the bench instead of standing. And he did it first in a preseason game. Um, how many people, you know, I don't know how many people watch preseason football games, but... Um, and it created this huge cultural firestorm, way outsized for one person sitting instead of standing. And um, I think it's really useful to see that reaction as not just a reaction to this one person, but as a reaction to a refusal to participate in cultural infrastructure that was maintaining inequity. And Kaepernick was very clear, I'm doing this because I don't want to stand to support an anthem for a nation that enables this inequity, the murder of unarmed Black people to continue. So he was calling it out. And um, the plot thickens a little on, on the national anthem story because, you know, A, Trump picked it up. And it became, as he said, a you know, it was a hot issue for him. It was a great issue. If he talked about it, people loved it. Um, the, the way that the anthem was talked about was entirely wrapped up in military service, which I thought was super interesting. Because, in fact, even after the anthem was written, and it wasn't officially the national anthem until the 1930s. So for, for a very long time, most of our existence, we didn't have a national anthem. 1930, things are going to hell in a handbasket. We need to <laughs> pull together. Here's a tool we can use. We can create a national anthem. The anthem itself is somewhat controversial because the third lyric that Francis Scott Key wrote um, in the initial version um, is a, it involves a threat to slaves who were fighting. The song is about the War of 1812. It's a threat, the third verse, is a threat to slaves who fought for the British, who promised them their freedom, and hirelings, so indentured servants and enslaved people who fought for the British. So that tells us a little something. But it's interesting because that that verse, that lyric got dropped. And um, it was around originally, it has come back and forth a little bit, but certainly by the time 1930s, it, by the time the anthem becomes an official official national anthem, it's long gone. But I think the most interesting piece of the national anthem story in our contemporary moment is that Colin Kaepernick took a knee in 2005. It wasn't until 2009. So I'm sorry, Kaepernick took a knee in 2016. But anyway, uh, seven years before that, the football league started requiring players to be on the field and to stand for the national anthem, which is not something they had done before. So 2009, we're in a war in Iraq, we're in a war in Afghanistan, and the NFL appears to be demonstrating this... Um, country loving patriotism. In fact, as John McCain and Jeff Flake reveal in a report from 2015, what actually happened was the Department of Defense, various entities in the US military started paying the NFL and all the other major sports leagues millions of dollars to engage in unmarked advertising for the military. So Kaepernick, when he is refusing 
to to stand for the anthem is actually unbeknownst to him explicitly reneging on a deal that the league made with um the D- department of defense and the fact that the league lost their minds about Kaepernick taking a knee in 2016 after they had been called out in 2015 tells you something about how entitled they felt to use these tools, not just to tell us who we are and to tell a story of national belonging, but to make money for the league. You know, in the league at this point, profits are um, quite enormous and they're trotting out people who are earning $20,000 a year to risk their life in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they're having people clap and they're behaving as if they're doing it out of the goodness of their heart, when in fact, you know, it's a money grab. So the whole thing, Kaepernick is trying to make a point about the murder of unarmed black people, but he falls into this um, really awful tangle of the Department of Defense using the national anthem a patriotic practice as a tool to make another kind of point in the culture to recruit, because as I said, after the Vietnam war, we don't have a draft. So you, when you have an all volunteer military and you're deep in two wars that are unpopular, um, you need all the help you can get right to recruit. And by 2009, they needed that help. So anyway, um, That is, those are some examples of how the patriotic practices piece of the story works. Yeah. And I mean, those examples for me illustrated so clearly how short our memories are, (laughs) how we think that some of these infrastructures that have always been this way are like 10 years old. Um, Mm -hmm. The way that people talked about the anthem, I thought was so interesting because in, you know, reporters and people in their op-eds and people on the street talked about, you know, it was such an insult to our veterans. And in fact, you know, especially if you went back to the World War II veterans or the World War I veterans, right? <sighs> Genuflecting in front of the flag is not what they fought and, and died for, right? They fought for the freedom to be able to think for yourself, and make those decisions for yourself. So it's not so much that there's anything wrong with the anthem. The issue is who is being forced to say it when and where, and why is it so important for them to make sure that everybody understands, and this is a fiction, understands that the anthem is really about military service. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the way, the way you unpacked that there with just asking some very straightforward questions um, was a model that you used throughout the book. I was so grateful for the really systematic way that you laid things out with just asking this series of questions of who's doing what and why and where and what that means. Um, And as part of that series of questions that you ask about all of these types of, of projects, you also asked what happened to various types of museums, memorials, and practices in the summer of 2020. Mm-hmm. So could you speak about the patterns that you see emerging about how um, different types of cultural infrastructure was or was not intervened with after George Floyd's death? Yeah. And, it, you know, I I appreciate the question and I... it. It's so odd to me. It's become um, just the way we talk about things, but it's so odd to me that, you know, George Floyd, um, the person who was murdered, has come to mean all of this other stuff, you know, and, and how Teddy Roosevelt's statue could become so linked to the murder of George Floyd is just, it's, fascinating. It's how cultural infrastructure works, I guess. After the murder of Floyd, especially in um, the summer of 2020, um, museums started asking themselves questions that museums, many museums had been asking for a long time in various ways, but they started asking the questions much more publicly. They started 
um, promising, everybody promised to rethink everything. <laughs> and in the world of memorials, you know, 170 memorials came down that summer, many of them Confederate memorials, many of them also um, Christopher Columbus memorials. Um, some of those memorials, especially the Confederate memorials, um, are protected by um, the United Daughters of the Confederacy built the memorials, the Sons of the Confederacy, um, the United Sons of the Confederacy have been with working with the daughters since, I don't know, the, the 20-teens to put in place um, mechanisms to protect those memorials. So there are some memorials that have come down that it's still an open question as to what's going to happen to them. Um, there are some that survived that summer that, you know, we're just hoping <laughs> they hold on and keep their head down. Nobody's, you know, people are going to get interested in something else and not come for them. Um, so I think there's dramatic change around memorials um, after George Floyd. And I think it will, I think, I think it's not, it's just not a story that's over. Um, I think that there are powerful people who will fight to put the Confederate memorials back up, who want them to end up in a museum. Um, the case of Silent Sam at the University of North Carolina, the university ended up, I think, I don't know that it's done, but the university at, at um, was required to pay the Sons of the Confederacy, $2.5 million for having taken Silent Sam down and for the future care of the monument. So on the one hand, he's gone. It's a victory. On the other, that's a lot of money for the university to give for the maintenance of a memorial um, to someone who... Um, was fighting to protect the right to enslave humans. <laughs> so, so I think that question is um, very much still wide open. And I think the same is true in museums and with patriotic practices. I think, um, I think in the case of patriotic practices, um, people didn't, they weren't as, as central in that sort of felt like Kaepernick even though he was talking about um, police brutality and the murder of unarmed black and brown people, his um, he didn't get a job. <laughs> Nobody hired him. He remained outside the National Football League. And his, the, his story wasn't returned to with the same, although the NFL did put, you know, racism, anti-racist slogans on helmets. They did, there was movement there. Um, the, I think the relationship between the anthem and military service, whereas in a lot of these other places, there was a crack. Um, the sort of logic was cracked open a little bit. I don't think that has moved. Um, I think I don't think the murder of George George Floyd moved that. I think in museums, I mean, there were all these conversations and um, symposium, and everybody was writing an op-ed. And um, I think the actual work of changing museums will be an institution by institution process, and it will be long and and harder in some ways than the other questions because the way in which museums operate, I was saying this a little bit before, the way in which they operate as cultural infrastructure is a little more subtle. Um, it's, a, it's a little more complicated. So on the inside, there, there are a lot of questions to ask and answer. And on the outside, the kind of biggest hit of the museum um, I think there are institutions, I'm at the University of Michigan, our own Museum of Art has done an awful lot to try and figure out how to meet expectations people have about what they're gonna get in the museum and then how to 
sort of change those and open them up and broaden people's thinking about what they're going to get in the museum. But I think, um, I think there's still work to be done in terms of museums really coming to understand how racial logics permeate the building. And um, I, I don't know what the right answer is. That's you know, with a Confederate monument, to take it down <laughs> is a pretty good response. With museums, you know, we don't want to take them down. We, we want we want them. We want the kids. I, I write a little bit in the book about the Toledo Museum of Art and all of the kids who come from northern Ohio and go into this museum and see all of this, these amazing objects, not facsimile, but real objects from um, Egypt, from ancient Egypt in their museum. And they leave the museum with a kind of naturalized idea. Of course, that stuff from Egypt should be in a museum in Toledo. There's nothing odd about that at all. And in fact, that is an expression of cultural power over many decades. So A, you need to figure out, make sure that everything you have in that museum came through a defensible process. And then you need to figure out how to tell the kids, this stuff is amazing. And these people were amazing. And it's here because, you know, colonialism. <laughs> but in some way that the that kids can understand. So I think it's a, it's a very, it's kind of a thrilling challenge. How do you, how do you counter the kind of big hit of the expression of power that Marvel was able to hit so quickly and then, you know, bounce into the rest of the museum? How do you hit, how do you address that? How do you make it explicit in a museum, in all different kinds of museums, in all different contexts? Mm -hmm. And, um, how do you help the kids understand, get a different blunt hit of, you know, what it means to belong in Toledo on a field trip on a Tuesday afternoon? Totally. Like there's a lot of exciting things that can be done there, but it is a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. 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 And the work is different, um, as you said, for every museum. Um, well, I have taken a lot of your time, but before we wrap up, I would love if you could share a little bit about what you're working on next, no pressure. Um, but if you have any new projects that have grown out of this book or um, anything entirely new you're working on that you could share about. I do have a new project that I am very excited to share. I, one of the things I, I, I wrote two pretty academic books before this book. And I, um, I really wanted this book to be less academic to be more for people who are interested non-experts than kind of continuing a conversation with experts. So I really appreciated hearing you say you liked my lists and you liked my repetition because I wanted just, I wanted to cut to the chase everywhere I could and make it very clear. Here's the, um, here's how, here's how this worked. Here are the questions need to ask to understand it. Um, and I'm going to try to replicate that a little bit in my next project, which I am working on with my um, longtime collaborator, Frank Mitchell, who is a curator in New Haven, Connecticut. And we are writing a book anticipating that in a few years, it's going to be the 200, we're going to celebrate the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And a lot of kids are going to go on a lot of field trips. Um, we are writing a series of, and it will be, a book, but it will also be an app, um, a series of alternative tours to historic sites. Oh, fun. Yeah. So, and it will be for the students and for the parents and for the teachers. So, so you can go to a historic site, a monument, a museum, you know, a historic house where kids are going to be going for um, these 250 anniversary celebrations and we we are going to be providing a resource w what are the questions you should be asking about this place how is this story told who gets to tell it um so uh working with existing sites and the 
um, the information they convey, but also adding um, more layers, um, suggesting that they that they see these sites in the under the umbrella of cultural infrastructure structures of uh, we've built in the culture to tell stories about who we are. So hopefully, kind of translating some of what's in this book to these other sites for a broad audience of um, middle schoolers going on field trips. Well, I hope that is really fun to work on. It is really fun to work on. Yeah, amazing. Um, Well, Kristen, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Uh, Once again, my guest today is Kristen Ann Haas, author of Blunt Instruments, published by Beacon Press. And my name is Jen Hoyer, and you are listening to the Scholarly Communications channel of New Books Network. (laughs) 